Hello, my name is Gina Piscatelli, and I'm teaching Anatomy and Physiology II at Madison Area Technical College. This is the first blood vessel lecture that you will watch online. Um, it addresses contents or topics in course competencies number 13 and number 16-2. For further information, please consult your textbook, chapter 19, section 1 through section 4. The topics that I'll discuss here in um, this first blood vessel lecture um, include the type of vessels that exist in the body, the structure of those vessels, including what kinds of tissues exist in the walls. Then we'll summarize the general functions of each type of vessel. Finally, we'll look at some disorders or vessel abnorm abnormalities that are common. So first, the types of vessels. There are three types of blood vessels found in the body. These include the arteries, the capillaries, and the veins. On this diagram, uh, you can see that there's another kind of vessel here that's colored green. But this type does not carry blood. It carries lymphatic fluid. So these are called lymphatic vessels. We will talk about the role of lymphatic vessels in our next unit. Since you've already studied the anatomy of the heart, you're familiar with the fact that arteries and veins have two different functions. Arteries conduct blood away from the heart, whereas veins return blood to the heart. The arrows in this diagram show you that this would be considered an artery, but so would this, that would be considered an artery. One is colored red for oxygenated blood, one is colored blue for deoxygenated blood. This blood is making its way to the lungs to become oxygenated. The veins that return, uh, the veins that are returning blood also may carry either oxygenated or deoxygenated blood. Capillaries, on the other hand, are the smallest vessels and they have um, the thinnest walls. Blood is still flowing through them, but they are known more for their role in the exchange of materials between blood and the interstitial fluid that exists between the cells of the body. In each person, there's somewhere between four to six liters of blood, at least in an adult. At any one time, 88% of that blood is contained within vessels of the systemic circuit, down here in green, 88%. Then 12% would be in the pulmonary circuit. You can see by this diagram that the veins versus arteries and capillaries hold the majority of uh, blood volume at any one time. Now, the coronary circulation here, considered part of the systemic circuit, has both arteries and veins. So in actuality, veins hold a little bit more than 60%. I'm just going to say 64%. I don't know. And arteries, maybe half of that of the 8% here. So maybe arteries carry 19% in the systemic circuit, but regardless, it's obvious that veins um, contain more blood at any given time than do arteries plus capillaries. So that reflects one of their functional aspects, and that is that veins have a high capacity for blood volume. For this reason, sometimes veins are referred to as capacitance vessels or a blood reservoir. We're going to look next at how um, the walls of the vessels account for this distribution of blood. There are actual anatomical differences in the walls of veins and arteries. So structure and histology of vessel walls part two. There is a basic scheme to the structure of all vessel walls um, this diagram tries to show that scheme with 
the presence of three different possible layers. So one is purple, one is blue, and one is red. And interior, that's the lumen where the blood flows. This space is shown um, too large. It's not that extreme. These different layers are adhered to one another in an intact blood vessel. So the outer layer, most superficial, is called the tunica externa. The one that's in the middle is called the tunica media. And the innermost layer is the tunica interna. The tissue types found in each layer include connective tissue that provides support. That's the role of the tunica externa. Then in the tunica media, the presence of smooth muscle is predominant. And that smooth muscle can contract or relax. When it contracts, we say the vessel is undergoing vasoconstriction. When the smooth muscle relaxes, we say the vessel is um, undergoing vasodilation. So that's the tunica media. Smooth muscle is prevalent. The innermost layer, the tunica interna, contains simple squamous epithelium. This simple squamous epithelium is smooth to minimize friction. But later we'll learn that um, there are also secretions produced by this epithelium, like nit nitric oxide, that makes uh, epithelium even more resistant to um, the adherence of blood vessels. It, it makes it very smooth, not sticky. We'll be looking in detail later um, about very about different types of arteries and different types of veins. But in general, we can say that all arteries are thicker in their walls are thicker than veins. Veins have thinner walls. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, arteries have a narrower lumen than veins. Like in the same location, if I were to pick these two vessels right here, an artery and a vein, the wall of the artery would be thicker, but the lumen of the vein would be wider. Arteries have elasticity. They can stretch to accommodate high blood pressure, and then they can recoil to allow blood to be propelled down um, the rest of the circulatory system. Arteries perform vasoconstriction and vasodilation um, much more than veins do because they have an extensive layer of smooth muscle. Veins are unique in that they have valves that prevent the backflow of blood. We want blood to flow from the capillaries up to the heart. I'm assuming we're down in the periphery of the lower limbs here. And as blood um, moves, it won't be um, pushed backwards because valves will prevent the backflow. The other um, generalization we can make is that capillaries throughout the body have very thin walls, the thinnest, because they're only composed of one layer. That layer is one cell thick, and it provides the ideal tissue um, for diffusion of materials between the blood and interstitial fluid. So this um, kind of outlines the different types of arteries and the different types of veins. They're usually categorized by size, and the size varies depending upon uh, their proximity to the heart. So vessels that are closer to the heart are larger, vessels farther away are smaller. So as blood is pumped uh, away from the heart, the largest artery is called the aorta. We would classify that as a large artery. And then it gives off several branches that we would call distributing arteries. You could also call them large arteries. And those arteries will branch and the vessels become smaller as branching occurs. So we would call this a medium-sized artery or a small artery. And at this point, 
this is where vasoconstriction and vasodilation can happen to help divert blood to the appropriate part of the body. Maybe not all of the blood would be diverted, but a proportion of it. Then the smallest artery is called an arteriole, and that provides arterial blood to a capillary bed, which is shown here. Now the arteriole is the smallest, and it does do vasoconstriction and dilation, just like small arteries do. From the capillaries, blood goes into the smallest known vein called a venule, and many venules uh, merge or converge into successively larger and larger veins. So we might say a small vein, and then a medium-sized vein, and then a large vein. Of course, the largest veins are called vena cava. So there's the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. One thing I'd like to mention on this slide is the changes in blood pressure and what makes blood flow. So you'll have um, learned this a little bit already, but I, I'd like to touch on it again. And that is that the way that blood moves is due to a pressure gradient. So blood moves from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So what that means is the ventricle has very high pressure and the arteries as you go down the arterial system exhibit lower and lower pressure. That's what makes blood flow. Then we have blood returning to the heart. So we have to continue that pressure gradient. So in the capillaries, there is higher blood pressure than in the venule and the venule has higher pressure than the veins, and the veins have higher pressure than the vena cava, and the vena cava have higher pressure than the atrium, the right atrium. Let's look at um, the different features of these different sized arteries. First, all arteries have three layers, three tunics, the tunica externa, the tunica media, and the tunica interna. The largest arteries, which are closest to the heart, have an extensive tunica media with elastin present. This elastin allows them to expand during ventricular systole and recoil during ventricular diastole, when the heart's at rest. That's going to help blood um, continue to flow. So they're able to respond to the fluctuations that the heart produces in blood pressure, and they can respond to very high pressures. The medium-sized um, arteries are called muscular arteries. They have a thick tunica media as well. And there's not elastin in here, but at this point, we see a lot of vasomotion or um, vasoconstriction and dilation that diverts blood flow to where it's needed, maybe from one organ to another. It says here that the medium-sized muscular arteries have the thickest tunica media. It's a little bit difficult to explain why it's written that way, this tunica media clearly looks thicker than this one. But proportionally, the wall of the medium-sized arteries is made up mainly of tunica media. It's a proportional view. The smallest arterioles have the smallest lumen, no elastic tissue, just like the muscular arteries, and they um, lead to capillary beds, and we also see vasomotion present there. Because arteries can do this vasomotion, vasoconstriction, vasodilation, they're often referred to as resistance vessels. Resistance refers to restricting blood flow, or at least inhibiting the speed of the blood flow. This is a picture of um, two different arterioles in the two different states. One is vasodilated, the other is vasoconstricted. 
Notice how the lumen of the vasodilated arteriole is much larger. It can accommodate more blood. Whereas the vasoconstricted arterioles lumen is so much narrower that it um, does not allow as much blood flow. Another structure that contributes to um, whether or not blood will flow through a capillary bed are, uh, or is a precapillary sphincter. So first, we talked just a minute ago about how if arterioles constrict, you will have less blood flow into this capillary bed. That just makes sense. The lumen will be more narrow, and you won't get as much blood. Um, passing through. This particular capillary bed is well perfused. Oxygenated blood is entering the capillary bed in many different pathways and converging all these capillaries are carrying um, deoxygenated blood towards the venule. Notice here at the base of some of these capillaries is a structure called a sphincter. It's made up of smooth muscle and in this case, that smooth muscle is not contracted, it is relaxed. But in the bottom diagram, this sphincter or smooth muscle is constricted, contracted, and therefore blood will not flow through these capillaries. Instead, the arteriole will carry by, mainly carry blood away from the capillary bed. Blood will bypass that entire capillary bed. But there are tissues surrounding the capillary bed, so those cells are going to need some oxygen. Therefore, some blood, a minute amount, I suppose, enters this vessel. It's called a meta-arteriole, and that carries oxygen, oxygenated blood, to um, the tissues here. So for the most part, the capillary bed has been diverted, but a minimal amount does enter. Okay, let's look at different types of capillaries now. There are three main types that differ in structure. One is a continuous capillary. These are the most common. Fenestrated capillaries is the second type. They're found in the kidneys and glands. The third type are sinusoids or sinusoid capillaries. They are present in the liver, bone marrow, and spleen. All of these capillaries, as the picture shows, um, are composed of a single cell layer thick tunica intima. This is simple squamous epithelium with a basement membrane surrounding the epithelium. The basement membrane in these three pictures appears as a transparent sheath. It's connective tissue, but very loose. What differs between these three types? Um, is how tightly adjacent cells are adhered to one another. The tightness of how they're adhered will determine how leaky or permeable they are. So continuous capillaries have tight junctions here. So it's hard for substances to get in between cells. For a material to leave the blood or enter the blood, it will probably have to cross up um, this cell membrane a couple of times, actually. In addition, there are parasites that surround the basement membrane of continuous capillaries. They can contract a little bit and just make the cell-cell junctions a little tighter. So continuous capillaries are the most common and they're the least permeable. Definitely the brain would have continuous capillaries with even more intense tight junctions. Fenestrated capillaries that supply blood to the kidneys and the glands are more porous. That makes sense. The kidney is supposed to filter the blood anyway. So what is present are slits in the cells themselves. Those are called fenestrations. These holes here are fenestrations. So the fenestrations allow substances to pass across the capillary wall, and they're particularly effective in making sure that waste products um, leave the bloodstream.
then sinusoid capillaries are um, perhaps the um, uh, least common, but most permeable. <clears throat> These have um, not just fenestrations, because they do, but the, in between the cells are huge clefts. What this allows is um, increased permeability, particularly important for white blood cells leaving the bloodstream um, and entering the systemic. Also important during hematopoiesis, when the bone marrow is producing blood cells, those cells need to get into the circulatory system. So the immature cells or the newly formed cells will enter sinusoids. Now there are different types of veins as we discussed, large veins, medium-sized veins, and venules. They all have a tunica interna and some degree of smooth muscle shown here in red. Even this is a little smooth muscle cell there. Large veins, the tunica externa is particularly um, prominent. It keeps the structure, the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. The medium-sized veins, the tunica interna, has folds that form the valves, the venous valves that I discussed before, that prevent the backflow of blood. Venules are composed mainly of tunica intima, but surrounded by a little bit of smooth muscle. Now, this smooth muscle can contract. When it does so, these venules become narrower. That process, instead of being called vasoconstriction, is called venoconstriction. Also, these venules, when venoconstriction is not taking place, are particularly leaky or porous. So you do get some white blood cell extravasation and fluid leakage from the venules. This picture um, shows you a little bit about how venous valves work. Um, because blood is far from the propelling force of the heart, blood pressure is quite low as you return um, blood to the heart. Veins don't have any recoil ability. There's no elasticity. So there's no way for the veins to propel the blood towards the heart either. So we have something else that aids the flow of blood and it's called the skeletal muscle pump. When skeletal muscles that surround deep veins contract, so these two skeletal muscles contract, they press against the wall of the veins and that forces blood to move. Now blood could move in both directions, be squeezed in both directions, but it can only move upwards or forwards, I should say. It can't move backwards because of the presence of these valves. So the valves prevent back, black, excuse me, the valves prevent backflow and ensure the proper direction of blood flow. This slide shows you a histological preparation of a nerve, a vein, and an artery from a very specific location or region in the body. We can just pretend that we're talking about the brachial artery and part of the brachial vein, it's not called that, median cubital, but um, the artery has a thicker wall, the vein has a thinner wall, the artery has a more narrow lumen, and look at the size of the lumen in the vein at the same location, very large. This is a cross-section through a nerve, so each one of these little circles is an axon or a neuron's axon. The other thing you can notice about the difference between an artery and a vein is the extensive elastic fibers that are stained dark blue here in the tunica media. Okay, let's look at the general function of all these different types of vessels. So this is the same picture you saw before. Uh, large arteries, or distributing arteries, then muscular arteries, then small arterioles, then capillaries, venules, and then small, medium, large veins. So generally what we see is the closer the vessel is to the aorta and the heart, 
in, on the arterial side, is that the purpose of these vessels is to distribute the blood, get it out to various parts of the body. Then when we get to arterioles, medium, small, and arter medium and small arteries, as well as arterioles, the purpose is resistance. And resistance acts to slow the speed of the blood flow so that by the time the blood gets into the capillary bed, the blood doesn't rush past too fast. It allows um, time for diffusion, um, exchange of materials, nutrients, and wastes. And then the veins are often referred to as capacitance vessels because they just hold a large percentage of the blood. Okay, let's do some review questions on those different features of blood vessels. If you compared the subclavian artery, oh, sorry, shown here, with the subclavian vein shown here, how would their lumen diameters differ? Which would be bigger? The vein. Number two, how would the thickness of the walls differ? Which would have a thicker wall, the artery or the vein? The answer is the artery. And which would be stiffer, and that would be the artery, and which would be more flaccid, that's the vein. And that's because of the, the wall thickness. Okay, number four, the layer found in all capillaries is called the what? Tunica interna. Then number five, which has the thickest tunica media, a muscular artery, an elastic artery, or an arterial or medium-sized veins? So this one's a little bit tricky, but where do you find elastic arteries versus muscular arteries? The most elastic arteries are the large ones. So they can do recoil. What that means is they have the largest tunica media compared to these two. And you can consider the arterial to not have a very thick tunica media either. Veins in general, they don't have a thicker tunica media than arteries do. Okay, number six, venous valves are continuous with which layer of a vessel wall? and that's the tunica interna. <clears throat> Number seven, arteries, elastin fibers are found in which layer? Tunica media. Then number eight, which type of capillary is the most common? Fenestrated, sinusoid, or continuous? The answer is continuous. Number nine, though, asks which type of capillary is the most porous, A, B, or C? The answer is sinusoid capillaries. Okay, this is the last part of our um, lecture for today. These, it includes vessel abnormalities and disorders. So the first um, disorder I'd like to discuss has to do with vessels that are stiff. We say sclerotic or hardened sclerotic vessels. So there's two subcategories of sclerotic vessels, arteriosclerosis versus atherosclerosis. They differ in why the wall of the artery is stiff or hardened. In arterial sclerosis, it's the tunica intima or tunica media of the artery that has thickened. You can see that right here. Um, it has lost elastin fibers, so it doesn't have the ability to stretch and then recoil. This can happen due to um, continuous hypertension or high blood pressure. So it can't stretch. It can't deal with um, fluctuations in blood pressure, and therefore it impairs the flow of oxygenated blood to tissues, and it makes the heart work harder to correct the problem. So eventually you could have a problem with the heart.
always arteriosclerosis you find in arteries, whereas atherosclerosis really technically could happen in any type of vessel, but it is most common in arteries. What you see is the lumen is filled with a substance. It's called a plaque. This plaque is usually lipid and obstructs the lumen. The plaque can be called an atheroma. If the atheroma is well developed, platelets usually stick then to it as well as the vessel wall in that location. And when platelets stick, they're activated. That makes them form a clot and they also release materials that cause the tunica media to become thicker. So now you're going to end up with also an accompanying arteriosclerosis as well. Overall, this plaque inhibits the forward flow of blood and the heart has to work harder. But equally dangerous is the possibility that this plaque and maybe the clot combination, there might be a clot in here, um, dislodges. And if the plaque dislodges, it's called an embolism, and it travels throughout the circulatory system until it reaches a vessel that it can no longer flow through because it's too large. That obstructs blood flow completely to those tissues. If that happens in um, the coronary circulation, obviously you would impair function of the heart. Okay, another type of um, disorder that I'd like to discuss is called an aneurysm. An aneurysm is defined as a weak point in an artery that bulges. Usually the weak point is um, in the tunica media. It could be in the tunica intima as well. So if you have three layers normally and the tunica media is leaky, then you could get blood flow between the tunica intima and media as well as between the media and the externa. That would cause a problem because it's super weak right here where the blood is flowing and the aneurysm could rupture. And if it ruptures, it would lead to blood loss, a decrease in cardiac output, and eventually circulatory shock, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The most common sites where aneurysms develop is the abdominal aorta, the circle of Willis, sometimes the kidney, but these two are more common. There's high pressure there because the brain, as well as the abdominal aorta, really need to transmit, or the brain really needs oxygenated blood, and the abdominal aorta, of course, carries the majority of oxygenated blood. So different things can cause aneurysms, um, hypertension, repeated high blood pressure or continual high blood pressure could make the wall of an artery weak and then this aneurysm or bulge could form. Um, but some other things could also cause an aneurysm. One would be a bacterial infection, maybe toxins weaken the wall. There's also a set of connective tissue disorders that are hereditary. Marfan syndrome is one of those. And in the abdominal aorta, um, you can see some, sometimes this sort of dissection that happens in people with Marfan syndrome. Varicose veins are also a blood vessel um, abnormality. Varicose veins are categorized by the distension and pooling of vein, a pooling of blood, the distension of veins caused by the pooling of blood, and the veins become enlarged. They also become very painful, and fluid leaks out of the veins, and you get swelling in the surrounding tissues. The reason that varicose veins develop is due to uh, venous pooling. Now, what causes venous pooling? Why would blood pool in the veins? Obesity, pregnancy. It could just be a genetic disorder and long periods of standing. The complication um, for all of these things is that if blood flow sits usually in the lower extremities in the veins, 
for a long period of time in pools, the valves get stretched apart so that they can no longer close. That further impedes blood returning to the heart. <coughs> so you almost have a positive feedback system. You start with venous pooling and then it's increased. Okay, the last type of vessel abnormality that we'll talk about is circulatory shock, specifically vascular circulatory shock. We've all heard this term shock. There's lots of types, nervous system, circulatory system shock. We're going to refer to here circulatory shock um, that occurs due to low cardiac output. If you have low cardiac output, you are not getting oxygenated blood where it needs to go. And you can have fainting and you can have organ malfunction, lots of issues. In terms of blood vessel causes, there's vasculatory circulatory vascular versus cardiogenic, meaning there's a myocardial infarction or something. So vascular circulatory shock is sometimes also referred to as distributive shock. And if you look at this report from the New England Journal of Medicine, it looks like 66% of vas of cases of circulatory shock are due to blood vessel problems. So what happens in vascular circulatory shock is that venous pooling occurs and you get low blood return to the heart. Low blood return to the heart is the key and that means that cardiac output will be decreased and it is caused by again long periods of standing or sitting but more commonly, this vascular circulatory shock happens very quickly, as opposed to something like varicose veins. Vascular circulatory shock can occur due to widespread vasodilation in response to being exposed to some sort of allergen or a bacterial toxin. So it's your immune system that is reacting to an allergen or a toxin and your immune system tells your blood vessels to dilate. Mainly the veins will dilate or at least blood will pool in the veins and you won't get blood flow back to the heart and therefore cardiac output will decrease. Okay, let's look at some review questions. Number 10, the circulatory disorder in which arteries lose the ability <laughs> Uh, sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Circulatory disorder in which arteries lose the ability to recoil is called arteriosclerosis. Number 11, a blank would cause blood flow between the tunica media and the tunica externa. And that's an aneurysm. Number 12, one danger of varicose veins is low venous return due to vascular pooling that is caused by the malfunction of what? And that would be venous valves. Thank you very much. That's all.